thing is 330. Only trust him. <laughs> song on the old sawdust trails of Texas when I was a boy. I hope my message today will reach all of you at least in some way. It's going to be possibly a little bit more like a lecture than a sermon. I was raising the question for the Reformation, which I'm asking the question, is it, is it dead? Or is it alive? Or is it still ahead? William Wordsworth wrote a poem, My Heart Leaps Up. And he has an apt line that binds the Reformation to current Protestantism. So Wordsworth composed, My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began. So is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old or let me die. The child is the father of the man. And I wish, I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. The child is the father of the man. That's the line, very apt for understanding that the Reformation in the, in the 1500s and the 1600s is the child of the father, which is, we could say, European Protestantism, and of the man, now American Protestantism today. From 300 A.D. until the dramatic rise of Martin Luther in Germany, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy dominated Christianity. But on October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed 95 theses on the cathedral door in Wittenberg, and most of these pertained to the practice of indulgences. When he did that, that was the shot heard around the world, or better said, the hammering heard around the world. But before Martin Luther, there were murmurings of reformation and, and, and a movement that we might call Protestant. 
The discontent with Catholicism was not only in Germany and Switzerland, but it was in England and Bohemia and in Scandinavia. Protestantism was and is not about being a church as much as it is a movement of faith and protest against beliefs and practices that in the Reformation time promoted the clergy and the pope which, was not in accord, which were not in accordance with scriptures. For example, one of these forerunners of Martin Luther was John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was born 200 whole years before Martin Luther nailed the theses on the door in 1320, and he died in 1384 in England. He denied the supreme authority of the pope. He attacked the wealth of the bishops and the abbots of the monasteries whose wealth was even envied by the kings. He denounced the money that was being taken out of England and sent to Rome. Wycliffe was hundreds of years ahead of the Catholic Church and even the German Re Reformation because he was the first person to translate the Bible not into Latin but into English. He believed that the Bible should be in the hands of common people, such as you, if I may call you common people. He also stressed that every Christian was a priest, as close to God as any priest ordained by the church. On doctrines, he disagreed on the doctrine of transubstantiation in which the church taught and still teaches that by the priest's prayer of consecration, the elements of bread and wine that we would take literally became and become the body and the blood of Jesus. And this and other practices John Wycliffe called superstitious, including the veneration of saints and their bodily relics, the shrines and the indulgences. I was in Zagreb, Croatia at one time in a huge cathedral. And I was fascinated by all the cases of relics from former bishops and even something that supposedly belonged to the apostle Peter. Now clearly Wycliffe was a forerunner of the Reformation and he died naturally with a stroke. But the flames of hatred in the, in the religion of that day was so great that even though he died of natural causes as a, in a stroke, years later his body was exhumed by the grave, from the grave by the Catholic Church and it was burned at the stake. Another forerunner was John Huss of Prague. He was born in 1369 and he died in 1415. John Huss was very outspoken against the corruption in the church and the indulgences, which I mentioned before. Indulgences were forgiveness and release of souls from purgatory by you paying money to the priests and to the church for the release of their souls from purgatory. That was indulgences. Well, it so happened that the Catholic Council didn't like John Huss very well in Prague. So they condemned him to death for heresy. They hanged John Huss and then they burned his body at the stake. The formal date of the Reformation is October 31st, 1517. You realize that means this is the 500th year. We're just two days short of the 500th year of the Reformation. At least that's the formal reformation. And Martin Luther is not the only reformer, obviously. But he does deserve a lot of credit. His life also was threatened by the church. He went on trial in a church trial. And he stood before the council that tried him, knowing that he might die. And he said those famous words, Here I stand, I can do no other. John Calvin was another reformer alongside Luther. And Calvin and Luther were Bible scholars. These were not just priests. These were not just monks. Yes, they were that. But they were real Bible scholars. And they are honored even today as theologians and thinkers. But they were influential for two reasons that some other reformers were not. And that is because the Gutenberg Press had been invented shortly before this. And Calvin and Luther disseminated their writings all over Europe because of the press. And second, they were assisted by rulers and large numbers of people who finally said, we stand beside you 
and Luther and Calvin consolidated power, a power base that could stand successfully against the power of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I'm mindful I've made some comments that seem like it's pretty anti-Roman Catholic. And in a private conversation with you, I would share different thoughts that I will not in this sermon. But I also have a certain respect for the Catholic Church today uh, that I would not have had if I'd have been living in the 1500s. Um, by the way, we just finished this. Well, we've got one more session of the Sunday School class. I've been really happy that Sally and Marilyn and Robert and then uh, Austin came one time and also I think Jen was there for a while today. This, Protestant, this class on Protestantism will have one more session next Sunday and then it'll be over. Thinking of next Sunday, I was just thinking, our diaconate meets next Sunday after church. So if you have any suggestions for the diaconate to, to undertake, we'll have our business session after church next Sunday. Let Ralph or Marcella, the co-chair people, uh, let them know of anything you'd like on the agenda for the diaconate. Now, Martin Luther's emphasis on the Bible is at the heart of the Protestant principles. Luther was the son of a miner in Thuringia in Germany. He had experienced a lot of violence when he was a young man. He also was considered himself a great sinner. And he was afraid of the judgment of God. He was afraid of the hammer coming down on him in judgment. And that's how he saw Jesus. Jesus is a cruel judge of our sinfulness until he started reading the Bible anew and differently. One of the ways he thought he would get to salvation was by becoming a monk, an Augustinian monk. And he also went to confession all the time. As you know, probably, this, it was a steady round of confession and penance in the Catholic Church and still is somewhat today. He also accepted the austerities of the monastery. And one of the reasons a monk becomes a monk or a nun a nun is to try and deflect the worldliness that otherwise would, would inhabit their minds and their hearts and their lives. But when he turned to the Bible, he found some scriptures that extremely were helpful. One was Psalm 22, verse 1. We didn't read it today, but that grabbed his attention. And guess what 22, 1 is? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. He identified these words, of course, rightly among Jesus' last words on the cross. And he could identify with the Jesus who he realized was forsaken by the Judaism of his day, just as Martin Luther felt that he had been forsaken by the Catholicism of his day. And now Luther began to understand that salvation was not going to come through the monastery and its austerities. It was not going to come through the uh, mass and the distribution of the, of the uh, sacrifice of the elements. But salvation would come through the sacrificial suffering of Jesus who died for the sins of the world. And now he understood that Jesus brought mercy and love and not just judgment upon humanity. And his second formidable insight in Scripture was in Psalm 31, verse 1, which Sally read today. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. The song we sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, was written by Luther. It's powerful language. And its text is taken from two passages in the Psalms. One is from this Psalm 31 and also from Psalm 46. <laughs> Luther not only believed that Scripture was the uh, source of our salvation and our teaching, not just the tradition of the church, not just what the church fathers had said previously, but he also said that faith alone, sola, sola fides in Latin, was where the righteousness comes into our lives. And just as that last verse that Sally read, the righteous shall live by faith. Until this revelation in Protestantism, the Roman Catholic Church had meted out salvation through the church and the sacraments 
and through the treasury of merits of Jesus and the saints. Now, a third doctrine was very important besides sola scriptura and sola fides, and that emphasis was on the priesthood of all believers or being a priest to each other. Did you know that you're a priest? In Protestantism, you're a priest. You're called by God, you're chosen by God to be a priest unto others. I'm a pastor. I can be a leader of a church. I can administer it. I can be sort of your priest who's ordained to, to do the, the communion service. But you know what? I am no better than any of you as a priest to others. And that was a very empower, important insight of Martin Luther. He wrote, It has been devised that the pope, the bishops, the priests, and the monks are called the spiritual estate, and down here are the princes, the lords, the artifers, the presents, who are the temporal estate. It's a very fine hypocritical device, Luther called it. He understood that the religious, which is still used in the Catholic Church, the religious being the priests and the nuns and the monks, the religious means that the rest of us are second-class citizens. Luther turned again to Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 for this doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. We are all one body, though each member does his own work to serve the others. This is because we have one baptism, one gospel, one faith. Another thing he said was, ordination, consecration, or clothes worn by priests and monks, different from the laymen and the laywomen, all these may make a hypocrite or an anointed puppet, but it will never make a Christian or a spiritual person. <laughs> this man's powerful. This is powerful stuff. So you've heard about the three cardinal doctrines of the Protestant Reformation today in this sermon. We also know that there were other associated ideas to the Reformation, not just in Luther and Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland. But there were the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists. The Anabaptists became known more likely as the German Baptists, the Dunkers, the Mennonites, the Church of the Brethren, the Brethren in Christ. I, I was thinking about that last one of those lines in Martin Luther's song. They, can, they may kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Do you know that Anabaptism means to be rebaptized? The Anabaptists believe in adult baptism. They did not believe the baptism as a Lutheran baby or as a um, Catholic baby was sufficient. I, I take some issue with that, but the point is that they believe strongly in adult baptism and also immersion. And do you know where the Dunkers got their name? The Dunkers got their name as Dunkers because the Catholic Church and some of the Lutheran churches would say to the, to the Anabaptists, you want to be rebaptized? Re we'll rebaptize you. And they put them on dunking stools and they put them down in lakes and ponds and drowned them. That's how the name Dunker came about. Think about the history of what Christians did and still will do to each other. Now today we have the historic mainline Protestant churches which are an extension of the Reformation. And you know them by the names of Lutheran and Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Methodist, and Congregational. But rust and dust have settled on most of these mainline denominations so that they hardly represent the cutting edge of a dynamic and growing Protestant movement that existed in the 1500s, 1600s, and even up until today. And in that sense, they increasingly, our mainline denominations, including First Congregational Church, represent the status quo and many of our churches are on life support or in hospice care. And most of us here today, think about it, and I'm not trying to disparage where we are, I'm just telling you, most of us here today will not be alive in 20 years or 25 years. So where will First Congregational Church be in 25 years? What will it look like? Or will this building become a museum just as many of the churches in Europe and Russia have become? 
Now, there are a lot of non-denominational churches and new church movements that are growing in America, but they're not necessarily Protestant. They have no historic ties to the Reformation, and in fact, they have contempt for the mainline churches that I've just mentioned. They're so proud to be non-denominational. They're so proud to be outside of this historic Protestant tradition. They do not promote scholarship. They have a rigid biblicism, which is mostly rhetoric and increasingly more political than spiritual. They count entertainment and cultural extravagance as the means of attracting people. And these churches are also unwitting victims of a secular culture in which we live, just as the mainline Protestant churches live. Mainline Protestant churches lament the secular attitude that churches are no longer relevant to generations younger than 50 years of age. How many of our churches actually have very few people under 50 worshiping in them today? And evangelical churches, they kind of, they're kind of bought into American ideas and values of, of uh, success. So evangelical churches groove on the idea that they have big crowds and numbers. The American culture to most religious people, both Protestant, Catholic, and Evangelical, would be described as falling apart. The Evangelical churches therefore want to support political agendas that would meet their religious and social ideas and therefore would blur the lines of church and state separation. Believe me, church and state separation was a very important Protestant principle and still should be. Anytime Catholicism or any ecclesiastical religion controls a state, religion is in trouble and so is the state. And the other way in which I think Protestantism is dying but not yet dead is that it is largely tribal rather than universal or diverse. Both evangelical and Protestant churches in America are tribes of whiteness rather and bastions of white people rather than demographically like the world is becoming rapidly. Is there any hope? Is there any hope for Protestantism and for Reformation? Is aliveness possible for Protestantism? And it's pure irony that some people have said that over the last six, 50 years, since 1962 with Vatican II, that the Catholic Church has become more Protestant and the Protestant churches have become more Catholic. How, what an irony, but there's some truth to it. What Reformation means is, is to reform, to be self-critical, to grow, to understand that the church should not dominate us in some kind of a, being a little puppet, but that it should help us to be empowered by the work of the Holy Spirit to bring change and to bring worship that's meaningful and to get into Bible study that is, that is enlightening and illuminating. Well, what is ahead? I don't know. You don't know. Even the sociologists and the prophets don't really know. But I would pray that there would be a vigorous witnessing and a prophetic ecumenical movement and that the Reformation then would be more alive and would be still ahead of us. And in the last analysis, the will of man is not greater than the love of Christ or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And the definition of Protestant is this. It is one who witnesses, or in other words, one who protests. I love it. How many of us Protestants really witness and how many of us protest? Mm -mm. And God will not leave this world without a remnant. And as long as one Christian reads the Bible and has the faith of a mustard seed to move a mountain and to answer the calling of vocation of being a priest to others, as long as there's one Christian who is this kind of a witness to the power of God's love and to the, then the Protestant Reformation will be alive. Will you lose that opportunity to be the last witness? Martin E. Mueller was a great German hero in World War I. And he became a famous Lutheran bishop who sometimes conferred with Adolf Hitler. 
Niemöller opposed the Nazi dictator and the Nazi regime. He would meet with Hitler, trying to save the German churches from being turned into Nazi shrines. He was eventually put into prison. Do you know that the Nazis would put swastikas in the place of the Christian flag up in the <coughs> altar in front of the cross, before the cross, cover the cross with swastikas? That's what Niemöller stood against. It's partly why he went to prison. But Niemöller late in his life, he survived prison, and he said, late in my life, I had a recurring dream. What a recurring dream it was. He would dream that he saw Adolf Hitler standing before Jesus on Judgment Day. And Jesus stood face to face with Adolf Hitler and said to him, or asked him, why did you do the ugly, evil things you did? Why were you so cruel? And Hitler would simply answer Jesus and say, because nobody ever told me how much you love me. And at that point, Niemöller would wake up in a cold sweat in his dream, remembering that he had had many meetings with Adolf Hitler, but he had never said, by the way, Mr. Hitler, Jesus loves you. He loves you more than you will ever know. He loved you so much that he died for you. Do you know that? So do not fail to be a witness. Do not fail to be the last witness of Protestantism. Don't lose that precious opportunity to alter the course of history as that last witness to the power of God and God's love in Jesus Christ. Be that last Protestant of the Reformation. Keep it alive. It can still be ahead of us. Amen. Our final hymn is O Zion Haste, Thy Mission High Fulfilling. O Zion Haste. 